I'll call the meeting to order of the State Government Finance Policy and Elections Committee, today being Wednesday, March 30th, 2022. My goodness sakes, we are rolling right into April. It just, uh, time is really flying by. So um, we're glad to have you all here. We have a full agenda today. To let you know, we have a hard stop at 10 to 12. We have session. And so we have a hard stop to enable us as senators to get over to the legislative session, but I think we should be able to get these bills done. This is the uh, last committee hearing for this week and meeting deadlines. So we will be getting all of our work done that is on our agenda today. Very important we do that. So Ms. Wilson, uh, if you go ahead and call the roll. Senator Kiffmeyer. Present. Senator Howe. Present. Senator Carlson. Present. Senator Clawson. Present. Senator Fate. Senator Curran. Present. Senator Pratt. Senator Osmick. Senator Fate. Senator Pratt. Senator Osmick. We have a quorum. Okay. Quorum being met. Uh, with that, we'll move ahead to our first bill on the agenda, Senator Port, uh, Senate File 3283. Um, welcome to the committee, Senator Port. Glad to have you here today. Uh, before we uh, get forward in presenting your bill, my understanding is you have an amendment, the A1 amendment. I do, yes, Chair. Would you like to explain it or have the yeah, I can, just, I can just briefly go through it. It's a technical amendment um, to narrow the scope to what was intended by the bill um, to have it cover candidates for legis the legislature or constitutional um, offices, not all public officials, soil and water, mayors. Uh, it, it is only meant to uh, cover candidates for the legislature or constitutional offices. So it's a technical fix on that piece. Um, and then also, uh, on lines 1.7, 1.8, and 1.9 of the amendment, it is using consistent language in other parts of statute uh, to identify political caucuses. Okay. This being an author's amendment, I appreciate the explanation, but Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And being, this being an author's amendment to uh, 3283, I move the, uh, the amendment. A1 amendment moved by Senator Carlson to Senate file 3283. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Port, now to your bill. Thank you, mm -hmm. Chair Kiffmeyer um, and members of the committee. I appreciate you hearing this bill uh, to continue to advance fair elections. Senate file 3283 is a fairly simple bill meant to address a loophole in campaign finance law that was brought to light through an advisory opinion issued by the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board on October 2nd of 2021. And it addresses the concern of transparency and undue influence on legislature, legislators by lobbyists uh, and political action funds. Voters across the country already believe that groups and individuals with money have more access to legislators, and this bill seeks to close a loophole that makes that true. This bill expands and clarifies existing campaign finance law to prohibit contributions from a registered lobbyist, political committee, political fund, or association registered with the CFB if, in exchange for that contribution, the lobbyist or other individual is granted special access to a meeting room, hospitality area, or other event space where public officials are likely to gather, and the primary purpose of granting that special access is to facilitate informal meetings or socialization with public officials during the regular or special session. Uh, today, I have Judge Beck and Ms. Belladonna Serrera to testify to the need of this bill, as well as uh, Jeff from the Campaign Finance Board to answer any questions. And if we could go to the testifiers. Okay, thank you, Senator Port. Um, Mr. Beck, you'll be our first uh testifier. Uh, if you are online, please identify yourself. Okay. Being reported, there might be a technical issue. So we're just going to go to the next testifier uh, and have that get worked out. And we'll 
we'll work to have Mr. Beck be able to uh, in some way uh, testify. Uh, with that, I'm gonna go to Anastasia Belladonna Carrera. Are you online as well? There you are. I sure am. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you so much for providing me with this opportunity to talk to you this morning. My name is Anastasia Belladonna Carrera and I'm the Executive Director for Common Cause Minnesota. I'm here today on behalf of over 18,000 multipartisan members across the state. Despite belonging to various Minnesota party affiliations or maybe not even affiliated at all, the one thing they've come together to do is support our work, ensuring that our republic's democracy is safeguarded, our elections continue to reflect the will of Minnesotans, and everyone's vote counts. I am particularly here this morning to voice our support for Senate File 3283. Common Cause and our members, supporters, and allies are growing increasingly concerned with the lack of access or the increasing lack of access to the state legislature and lawmakers to constituents. These last two years being the period when we've received the most statewide complaints from constituents of various party affiliations. The public conference committees appear to have become a thing of the past. Negotiations that we've seen have moved behind closed doors, shutting the public out and making it virtually impossible for constituents to hold any members accountable. This bill prevents yet another advantage to Capital Insiders. Many of you may have seen the advisory opinion from the Campaign Finance Board relating to this issue. We were relieved when Senator Miller spoke unfavorably to this idea and are grateful that Senator Port took swift action to prevent these types of insider clubs from being a common occurrence now in Minnesota. We firmly believe that any spare time a member of the legislature find themselves with, as difficult as that is, should be spent in their districts, directly engaging with constituents, learning more about how issues impact every corner of their district, and not behind closed doors of any type of insider clubs between lobbyists and electeds. This bill provides a common sense and narrow approach in preventing pay to play lobbyist clubs granting special interest groups access to our decision makers while keeping constituents and other community stakeholders out. There's nothing partisan about protecting the integrity of the sacred relationship between constituents and their elected officials. Common cause and our members are opposed to any idea that creates unequal access for, for Minnesota constituents at our Capitol or to their legislators. This is why we support the bill before us today. This is why we will continue to work with members of the other committee and the other chamber from across all partisan aisles to make sure that that sacred relationship remains intact. Thank you for your hard work and more importantly, thank you for yes on Senate file 3283. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Belladonna Carrera. And now we'll go to George Beck. Um, Mr. Beck, glad you were able to um, get things worked out. If you wanna go ahead, announce yourself, who you're representing, and then go ahead and present your testimony, Mr. Beck. Okay, we're trying. Uh, I do have a question for Mr. Sigurdsson, who is here today to answer questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Sigurdsson. For the audio record, just say your name and title, and then I'll ask the question. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Jeff Sigurdsson. I'm the executive director of the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. Thank you very much. My, since you have um, given the uh, campaign finance board opinion in regards to this issue. Uh, I do have a question for Mr. Sigurdsson, who is here today to answer. I'm sorry, who is that speaking? Mr. Sigurdsson, for the audio record, just say your name and title, and then I'll ask the question. Good morning, Madam Chair. We're not sure where that is. It's someone.
We're working on it, members. Campaign Finance Board opinion in regards to this issue. We do have a question. This is, this is somebody else's getting into our uh, Senator Coran. Okay, Mr. Beck, um, you are probably having background and we can hear the words in the conversation. So you may not want that to be the case. So if you can make it that we don't have that. Um, Mr. Beck, are you ready? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Mr. Beck. This, this is somebody else's getting into this. I'm ready. I'm hearing, I'm hearing that feedback, Thank Madam you. Chair. Well, it's not feedback from us, Mr. Beck. Okay. Near as we can tell, this is feedback from that's coming in through your link to this hearing. Mr. Beck, if you'd like, you could also make a use a telephone and call in via phone. Mr. Beck, are you ready? May I proceed, Madam Chair? Well, Mr. Beck, we have two voices coming in through your line right now. I'm ready. I'm hearing, I'm Mr. That. Beck, just a moment. It's not anything here. Mr. Beck, are you listening to the YouTube live streams at the moment? Yes. Please turn that off. You can turn it off or mute it. That is about 30 seconds behind. It causes an infinite loop. Okay. okay, Mr. Beck, if you just turn off the sound or turn <laughs> off the live stream. Until you do that, Mr. Beck, we can't have you give testimony. All right, I'll do. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. Um, that makes sense now. I understand. It was sound like, like it sounded like my voice, but I wasn't. Uh, it was interesting. Okay, um, so back to this, Mr. Secretson. In regards to what date did you issue the opinion, and since that date, have you seen any uh, anyone acting on that advisory opinion or setting this up or anything, uh, Mr. Secretson? Uh, Madam Chair, the uh, advisory opinion 454 was issued on October 6th, uh, 2021, and no, uh, to this point, uh, the board is not aware of any uh, party unit or any other entity taking advantage of, of the provisions of that advisory opinion. Mr. Sigurdsson, yeah, I have to really almost I, chew on the microphone. Okay, I apologize, uh, Madam Chair. Again, to repeat, the advisory opinion 454, which is, I believe, the basis of this bill, uh, was issued on October 6, 2021. And to your other question, to the board's knowledge, there has not been a party unit or other entity that's taken action based on the uh, provisions of that advisory opinion. Okay, so October of 21, and there's been no action that you know of. Okay, uh, Mr. Beck uh, has given us notice. He is able to come on. Mr. Beck, please state your name and and who you're representing for the audio record, then proceed with your testimony. And to let you know, we do have a copy of your, uh, a written copy of your statement. Mr. Beck. Madam Chair, can you hear me? I can hear you, Mr. Beck. You could speak a little louder, but I can hear you. All right, uh, thank you so much for bearing with me. Uh, Chair Kiffmeyer and members, my name is George Beck. I'm on the board of Clean Elections Minnesota. Last year, a party unit sought and received the approval of the Campaign Finance Board to create a fundraiser that challenged the law prohibiting campaign contributions during the legislative session. The party unit proposed to create an event during the session for its legislators and then invited lobbyists and others seeking legislators time. The general public was not welcome. The event would be supported by contributions from lobbyists made prior to the session. Access would then be provided during the session based on those pre-session payments. The board unfortunately decided that this did not violate the no contributions during the session law, but in fact, it created a special opportunity for lobbyists and their clients by prepaying for the exclusive privilege to lobby elected officials while the legislature was in session. This special interest plan at least violates the spirit of state law 
and needs to be addressed. Senate file 3283 specifically prohibits contributions from lobbyists at any time of the year, which is used to provide special access to a meeting with legislators during a regular or special session where the public is not invited. Senate Majority Leader Jeremy Miller has recently been quoted as saying that he has no plans to hold such an event. This bill had bipartisan support in the House Committee, and we hope it receives unanimous support from this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beck. All right, uh, members, um, we have had our two testifiers here, and I'll now open it up to questions from the uh, questions from the committee. And um, I was just wondering, I was just wanted to start out, I know we have quite a few questions from members. Uh, what constitutes special access? What's the definition of special access in your bill? Uh, thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer. Um, you know, it, it is uh, particular access, whether that is to a, a private room or a special club that is only available to uh, the person or lobbyist or political action group that has paid prior to the session. Well, I'm a little interested here. Um, it states that if in exchange for the contribution of registered lobbyist or any other individual is granted special access to a meeting room, hospitality area. And so special access implies there's access, special access. Um, once you've described access with the word special, so what does special access mean to you? So in lines 2.7, thank you, Madam Chair, in lines 2.7 through 2.12, it defines special access um, as privilege to enter and use a space that is not freely available to members of the public or is subject to the discretionary approval of the responsible candidate, campaign committee, political committee, or party unit. Yeah, I've, I've read that. I, I was interested in what the word um, special access. In other words, you could have regular access. You just can't have special access. You've created a, a word situation here. And so that is why I was asking that. Uh, maybe we can think about that a little bit and I'll let another member ask a question. Senator Howe. Well, th thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Port. Uh, actually, I got something coming up on Friday. Mm -hmm. I've got a, I have a constituent that has actually donated to my campaign and we're gonna have coffee at a local restaurant whose owner also donates to my campaign and we're going to use their meeting room and we're going to go have a private conversation. Am I going to violate this rule by doing that? Because I'm not going to allow anyone else into the room while we're having our private conversation. Is that special access? If Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Howe for that question. Um, so this specifically uh, applies to lobbyists and political action committees uh, and um, political funds uh, not to open contributions that you can receive anytime. And I'm, I'm, I guess I, I would sort of ask you if that is, um, if you would only grant access like that, have a meeting with a constituent only because they donated money to your campaign, I don't think that's true of any of us up here. Um, and it certainly shouldn't be the only way that a constituent can meet with us. But this is in particular in response to lobbyists, to political funds, and to political action committees. Senator Hall. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Port, my concern is on Pline 2.3, it says a regis registered lobbyist or any other individual. I would have to assume my constituent 
fits any other individual who then I can't meet with on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And to I don't think any of us would make a difference whether they happen to contribute to us or don't contribute to us to meet a constituent. We meet with them all the time, whether, and I don't go check the donation roster to make sure whether they donated to me or not. But my concern is, is just because he did donate to me and just because he, we are meeting in a room that I'm not gonna allow anybody else to come into because we're having a private conversation about his issue. I, I, I think I meet, meet those requirements in 2.3 and 2.4 and I, how do I get around that? And how do I not end up getting charged with violating campaign finance rules and, and this statute if I do that? I'm gonna have to go to court to prove myself innocent of something that I think would fit this this definition. Senator Port. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I think also having uh, Mr. Sergetson uh, respond to that, but but the first part has to be true as well. The part in uh, two point or one point two one through one uh, two point two have to be true before we look at sections one and two or subsections one and two. So if it is a contribution from a registered lobbyist, political committee or political fund, that in exchange for that contribution, then number one, numbers one and two come into play. Senator Port, uh, I find that interesting. Uh, when I think of meeting with constituents and I have to go through this exercise on a regular basis, I get really concerned for the constituents or any other individual is gonna be put in a situation that we're gonna be questioning meeting with constituents. And in particular in the legislature, I think the testifier just before you was complaining about not having enough access. And by the way, to comment on that, my gosh, we just went through COVID. The Senate has been way open open for in-person meetings, uh, open for personal testifying. Now the House, that's a different case. But over here in the Senate, even last year, we've been very open. And, uh, but now we're talking about in-district constituent meetings. Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Port, my concern is, do I have to ask him what associations he belongs to? Because I don't know what associations these folks belong to. And I just take meetings with them. Uh, my concern is, is he could belong to a, a lake association, a, a uh, AIS uh, association, someone that's fighting uh, aquatic invasive species. I don't know that. Uh, and am I gonna have to answer that and get that information prior to? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Howe. Uh, Mr. Sigurdsson, but I also have Senator Osmick. Do you want me to wait for Mr. Sigurdsson, and then come to you. Okay, Mr. Sigurdsson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Howe. Remember, there's two parts to the test. The, as um, Senator Port was was referencing, the contribution that you received from um, your constituent would only come into play if the, if your constituent was also a lobbyist or was making a contribution through the political committee or political fund because they're covered as well. So, a, a contribution from an individual isn't going to be falling under the first provision here or the first test. And second, remember the last few words there of line 2.2 in exchange for the contribution. So even if your constituent was a lobbyist, it would have to be, I'm giving you this contribution and in exchange for that, you agree to meet with me in a private location during the regular legislative session. So that would seem, I think, to make it unlikely that uh, any that your usual constituent meetings are, even if they're in private, are going to be, uh, uh, would fall under the regulation of this provision. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Senator, One more, Senator I Howell. guess I, I'm not sure how I prevent having that, being accused of only taking meetings with people that, that would uh, donate to me. I, you know, I, I don't track who calls for a meeting and who's donated, 
Uh, but it seems to me if they if they belong to an association that's not a, registered with you and it has the perception and and keep in mind in this realm perceptions reality to the folks out there so if it's perceived that way i'm guilty until i can prove myself innocent on this deal and because it's the perception even though it it is could be further from the truth uh that's the headline that i i'm afraid i'm going to face at this period thank you madam chair uh thank you senator how uh senator osmick thank you madam chair i've got a couple of questions for senator Port. First one, Senator Port, on lines 2.5, you identify, um, quote, the primary purpose of granting the special access. Um, there's nothing in this bill that identifies how you determine primar the primary purpose, and there's nothing here that identifies who determines the primary purpose, because this comes down to intent. How are you going to, in this bill, provide guidance as far as the intent to determine that primary purpose and who is going to be the enforcing mechanism to determine that. Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer and, and Senator Osmick. Um, like all of our uh, rules that govern campaign finance, uh, the Campaign Finance Board oversees them in the state of Minnesota. And so they would be the ones that would, a complaint would be filed with and they would you know, facilitate that complaint. Senator Osmick. So, then I guess we'll go to Mr. Sigurdsson. Um, how are you going to, based upon the plain reading and the language in this bill, how are you going to determine intent based upon the primary purpose of granting access? What measurement or what, uh, what methodology is going to be used to determine that primary purpose and that intent? Senator Port. Um, or Mr. Sigurdsson. Okay. Senator Kefmeyer, or Madam, Madam Chair, or Senator Osmick. Um, it again becomes using all of the uh, parts of the all the provisions of, of the bill um, we would one was there actually an exchange was there a transaction where here's the contribution here's what I expect for the contribution and then in terms of the purpose the primary purpose um, that would be you know a matter of fact I mean the uh, what was the meeting to arrange um, yeah, you know, was there a regular uh, type of meeting that was held in an office that that anyone would have access to? Well, then it's not going to be a, a you know special access to facilitate informal meetings, and it doesn't have that as a primary purpose. So then it's simply a matter of stepping back and saying, okay, if there wasn't a transaction in the first place, uh, this provision doesn't apply. And if there was a transaction, does it uh, provide special access during a regular or or special session of the legislature? So I, I think that. Um, Primary purpose, you know, I, that is an interesting term. I'm not, uh, I believe in the House version, the term primary was, was taken out, but um, it, it, I don't think the board would, would struggle too much with determining what was the purpose for that particular meeting. Senator Osmond. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I do have an issue with determining that primary purpose because we're writing that into the legislation and uh, it's entirely possible that a meeting could take place and oh, wait, oh, by the way, at the very end that something happens. Um, then you have to, deter I guess then you'd have to measure how much of the meeting was of different subject matter versus how much of the meeting dealt with any kind of contribution at the end of it. I mean, and then is it 50-50? Is it 70-30? What is the number? I mean, there's nothing here that defines it. So I guess I have some serious reservations as to putting this level of for lack of a better term, squishy language into put into place to determining quote the primary purpose. But I'll leave that alone. Uh, I have one additional question for S uh, Senator Port. Um, you have de you have defined registered lobbyist, political committee, political fund, or an association not registered with the board. Question for you: Does this all would also your language also to apply to certain organizations such as Education Minnesota, SEIU? MAPE, uh, any of those organizations that certainly have some level of interest in connecting with, uh, with le the legislature or with senators or representatives, does, this, does your law here or your proposed bill apply to those uh, organizations equally? Senator Port. 
Um, can I address the last question for a moment first? Uh, Senator Osmick, in the amendment that we adopted, primary was removed from the bill. Thank you, Senator Port. Senator Port, to the Thank question. You. And uh, perhaps, yes, Senator, okay. Mr. Segerson, uh, we've gone through this piece. Okay. Mr. Segerson. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Osmick, the, um, the three organizations that you mentioned all have political committees or political funds registered with the board, so they would have been covered in the prior provisions. And the uh, ability for the other, for an unregistered organization to provide a contribution is also regulated under Chapter 10A because remember, these are political contributions. So um, if, if they were um, not registered with the board, were still eligible to make a contribution, then they'd have to provide disclosure and, and again, would be covered by this provision. Senator Osmick. Uh, so I think the quicker answer is yes, um, I, which I appreciate that. Second, I just want to talk about that primary, the word primary, and I think I was sort of into the room at the same time that the amendment was taking place, so I apologize for going after the word primary, but I still look at, when you're striking the word primary, you're still having the purpose. So it still creates a very large amount of squishiness in the language, in my opinion. So, uh, but I appreciate the fact that the word primary is in there because primary would be in the eyes of the boulder. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Osmick. Uh, members, we have a hard uh, adjourn here today at 10 to 12. We have many more questions, but to let you know, this bill is being laid over for possible inclusion. And so uh, we'll have another opportunity to um, ask questions about this, but we're going to have to get to the other two bills as well. Um, since we've had questions from um, this side of the table, Senator Carlson, I, I just one of you, one question, if we could. Mine is a very brief question for uh, Mr. Siegertson, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Siegertson, uh, there was a question that asked if anybody had taken advantage of this particular uh, process yet, and you said you weren't aware of it. I'm wondering how would you be aware of it? Uh, what What kind of discovery would uh, lead you to be aware of it. And would these, uh, for instance, contributions that are related to this have to be separately articulated or would you have to have a separate pack or separate uh, um, reporting of this particular type of con uh, contribution so that you could keep track of it? Mr. Sigurdsson. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Carlson, um, Remember the advisory opinion only provides cover or I should say safe harbor for the entity that asks the, uh, the advisory opinion. Uh, in this case, although the specific requester is not identified, I think it's fairly obvious that it's a legislative caucus that asked the question because it wouldn't apply to any, any other type of party unit other than legislative caucus. Um, I believe frankly that members would know if there was a, a club or organization like this available, if there were contributions being received um, and, and then also the in-kind contribution to the, to the uh, senators for access to the facility as outlined in the advisory opinion, that would all be on the report submitted by the legislative caucuses. So it would be identified on the report if it occurred. Thank you, Mr. Sigurdsson. Okay, uh, members, uh, we're gonna lay this bill over, but before we do, uh, probably the biggest thing, I was thinking favorably this, but when I hear this and I think of the chilling effect this can have on meetings with our constituents, it gives me great concern. And so I just want us to all think about that it's being laid over so we have a chance to do some more work uh, uh, coming up here, but I think it's really important to realize when I think of a checklist before you take appointments to be sure. And I understand what you're saying, Mr. Secretson, but you're on the staff of the Campaign Finance Board. We're talking about us who have uh, citizen meetings all the time. And um, at the current law, none of us raised money during session. We didn't take it. There was even a mistaken check given to me, it wasn't signed. But because I picked it up after session had started, I informed, um, can't remember, just made, went through all the information. We didn't even issue a corrective check with a signature for fear that we might possibly trigger a mistake there. It was fine, it's just fine, we can wait on that. But I mean, already that is a level of care that people go through under current status 
to um, make sure that we don't do that. So I just wanted to know, and I, what I really don't want to have happen is uh, that we make things potentially worse in a different way. And uh, so I'm just concerned about that, but it doesn't mean we can't do something here, but I, I think we need to think very carefully. So a report uh, before I lay it on the table. Yes, thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer. I think the, the most important thing to think about with this bill is that it was crafted very carefully and has three requirements before any uh, violation would occur. It has to be a contribution from a lobbyist political action committee or, or political fund. Or an individual, correct? No. Okay. Uh, and then in exchange for that contribution, the registered lab numbers one and two have to take place. So the, it's worded very carefully that if on line 2.2 .2 is, you first have to have that contribution from a political action fund or a lobbyist, and then you have to have both one and two. So it is a three-step process, and if all of those don't happen, it is not a violation. So it is crafted very carefully. I encourage you all to continue to look at it. I'm happy to answer questions as this continues to move forward, and I hope we do you know, continue to have a conversation about this because it is important that we are safeguarding access for our constituents exactly like you raised, uh, and, and I hope we can continue to have a conversation about it. Well, we'll continue, Senator Port. Thank you very much. But I have serious concerns about the constituent issue. And I think that is something that is very, very important to us and to the work of our legislature. So we'll continue. And with that, members will lay this bill over for possible inclusion. OK. Okay, we're just going to get um, set up here and um, my agenda got lost. I just want to be sure I have the right bill. Senator Benson, welcome. Uh, Senate file here 4359. Um, welcome to the committee, Senator Benson. And when you're ready, uh, state your name and title, and then present your testimony. Thank you. I am Madam Chair, um, Michelle Benson, Senate District 31. Um, and let me begin by being clear with all the stakeholders involved. Uh, this was a late introduction and an expedited hearing. And I appreciate that, Madam Chair. This is not final language. And I know that there is a lot of stakeholder engagement that needs to happen because there is a lot of nonprofit interaction with the state. And Madam Chair, if I could ask for some help in bringing the bill before us, and then I do have an A1 amendment okay. that I can treat as an author's amendment, if you would allow me. Okay, Senator Benson, um, let me... I have the A1 amendment and I'll move the A1 amendment to Senate file 4359. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion prevails and is adopted. Senator Benson to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I've spent years here in the legislature of seeing nonprofits who want to do charitable work become in fact, de facto agents of the state of Minnesota because so much of their funding ends up coming from the state of Minnesota. And so while they want to do good charitable work, they in fact become funnels for taxpayer dollars. So there have been years of nonprofits coming before all of our committees that spring up in one year and then the next year coming to ask for funds. We as legislators, need to do a better job of asking for their 990 and looking into their history. But we also think, I also think it is important for the administration to do some of that work as well. And so 
Madam Chair, the A1 amendment really gets to those organizations who have the plurality of their funding, a majority of their funding coming from state grants. So if you are a food shelf who you know, has $3 million in donations, but you get a $250,000 grant to the state, this language, uh, it's not my intent that this language would apply to you. But if you're coming to the state for a majority of your funding, then we should absolutely have increased transparency and accountability. So some key provisions, obviously we define grants, um, requirement for eligibility. You should be in existence and doing your work for at least two years before, before you come to the state of Minnesota. If you're a charitable entity and you're going to primarily rely on the state of Minnesota, then the legislature should make it clear that you do not need to make, then your executives do not need to make more than the governor of the state of Minnesota. And Madam Chair, that's a debatable provision. We know that nonprofits need to be able to hire talent but if you are essentially a fiduciary of the state, then the legislature should have some say in where that money is going. Um, additional requirements. You cannot have an employee of the state as part of your organiza organizational structure. It is my opinion that having that state employee or elected official would give you an advantage in accessing grants. Um, continuing eligibility requirements, and this is where the amendment language becomes a key part. 50% uh, of your revenue from state funds in a fiscal year, they must meet specific criteria. They must have audits in place. They cannot have anyone on their board who is involved in embezzlement or theft of any sort. Um, we need to hold them to a high standard and then leg the legislature needs to be given notice. I know the Department of Admin has some concerns with this. I appreciate that. But given my years of watching nonprofits, again, there are many charitable organizations who are doing their dead level best to care for the people of Minnesota in serious circumstances. But if it is your intention as an organization to have more than 50% of your revenue come from a state grant, then you should be prepared to have a different level of accountability than other charitable nonprofits. And I did receive, and obviously because of late introduction and late notice, I did receive comments from the Minnesota Council on Nonprofits. I am happy to take a meeting. And Madam Chair, if any part of this gets included, it, I will work through it with the stakeholders and give the committee feedback. Thank you, Senator Benson. Does anybody else have questions here? Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Benson. This is a, a great step forward to, to start reviewing uh, what's going on with our nonprofits and the expansion of what uh, has happened with our nonprofits. I will say I think it needs to go further, but uh, this is definitely a, a, a step in the right direction. Uh, to me, if uh, if nonprofits are, are worth their weight, uh, they should be able to draw those funds from our, the, the, our constituents out there from the public. And, uh, and th that public can uh, take a, a deduction on their taxes. Uh, it shouldn't be for the state of Minnesota and for us at the legislature to take the tax proceeds that we collect from people and then we decide what nonprofits uh, are, uh, good enough to receive our, our, our dollars. Uh, I think that's a mistake, and I think this is a definite step in the right direction, and I thank you for the bill. Thank you, Senator Howe. Uh, with that, we have a testifier, Stacy Christensen. Ms. Christensen, are you in the room? Or if you are online, please uh, state your name, and there you are. Okay. Welcome. And uh, again, state your name, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Chair Kipmeyer and committee members. For the record, my name is Stacy Christensen. I'm an assistant commissioner at the Department of Administration overseeing the Office of Grants Management. The Department of Administration fully supports the important fiscal accountability and grant making. My remarks this morning relate to the logistical and fiscal challenges that this bill poses for the department. In Minnesota, state grant making is decentralized. 
That means that while state agencies all must follow the Office of Grants Management's policies, there isn't a central repository or central location for the administration of all state grants. For this reason, the Commissioner of Administration would not have information on all of the individuals requiring a background check under Section 1, Subdivision 3 in the bill. Additionally, admin does not currently have adequate staffing or funding to conduct all of the required background checks under this provision. Background checks for new employees in state government cost approximately $30 per check, and this new requirement could potentially result in thousands of additional state background checks. Because the Commissioner of Administration does not award all state grants to nonprofit organizations, it is also unclear how she would make an adequate determination required under Section 1, Subdivision 2, as part of the notice to the legislature described in Subdivision 4. The reporting requirements in Section 1, Subdivision 6 are somewhat unclear. Is this a requirement for one report from each state agency that includes all of the grants it administers? or is there a separate report, re report required for each grant at an agency? In a small agency such as admin, this could amount to over 65 different reports each year. In larger agencies, this could mean hundreds or even thousands of reports each year. Current state grant policy requires annual grant reporting from grant recipients to individual state agencies with the statutory authority to administer that grant. This existing requirement ties grant reporting directly to the individual grant appropriations discrete requirements. For the majority of state grant appropriations, the ongoing reporting to legislative committees is already in place. It is an internal control that sets an annual reporting requirement while accommodating the distinct requirements of the grant appropriation. Finally, please note under current law in Minnesota statutes 609.456, state agencies are required to notify the Office of the Legislative Auditor when evidence of theft, embezzlement, or unlawful use of public funds has taken place. It's unclear if the language in Section 1, Subdivision 7 would work with the existing statutory requirements or present a risk to due process. We recommend working with the existing statutory language and ensure that state agencies are effectively resourced with internal audit staff for this purpose. We look forward to supporting state agencies, the legislature, and the grant applicant community, including the nonprofit sector, on our shared commitment to fiscal accountability and transparency. We understand that agencies require adequate resources to implement the critical administrative supports that are necessary requirements of state grant investments. In conclusion, I'd like to thank the chair and committee for taking the time to hear this testimony. Admin and the Office of Grants Management are willing to work with the author to address the concerns I've identified today. We're also requesting the opportunity to prepare a fiscal note to document the additional costs to the agency that I mentioned, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Madam, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. And like Senator Benson, to, do you I'd have like any to other? Thank Ms. Christensen. In fact, in 2013, I tried to get an understanding of how the Department of Admin managed grants, and it was like nailing jello to a wall, frankly. So this is not new for me that we have all of these moving parts, but what we don't have is a clarity um, for the benefit of the legislature as to who's accountable. So we look at, for example, the Department of Education wanted to stop payments to a recent nonprofit, and a judge said, you don't have the authority to do that. We're looking for a way, and this language has been building for a long time. Um, but now we would have had, the Department of Education would have been able to say, it violates state law that they don't have their 990s up to date. And the judge could have stopped some of those payments. And so um, I would love to work uh, with the Department of Admin to find a way that we could have for those nonprofits that are primarily an agent of the state, a level of accountability and transparency that we would have um, our taxpayer dollars go to. Thank you, Senator Benson, no question about it. And uh, just to mention members, there is enough interest in this whole topic of uh, grants uh, that on the final topic selection, uh, that we voted on recently in the legislature in the House and Senate, out of the 10 topics, three of them 
specifically pertain to grants. And matter of fact, uh, was voted in as the final topic as well. All three of them bundled together as one. So this is a very bipartisan interest in this grant area and uh, the topic of what's going on and make sure there's accountability. So I, I felt it was very timely uh, to hear this bill considering the broader interest of the legislature through the topic selection. So Senator Benson, we're gonna lay this bill over and if there are portions of it or as you think about this some more that we can maybe incorporate some of these things as I think it is, it is very important to do. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, it is for those nonprofits who are becoming in fact an agent of the state because of the level of funding they receive on grants. It is not to go after small nonprofits um, who have an incidental or small grant addition. So I think there are ways that we can move forward. Um, and I know there are nonprofits in every single committee jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And so taking feedback from my colleagues is uh, gonna be part of this process before we get to the end. Mr. Benson, we do have one question, yeah. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And because this is a work in progress, I, there's just a few things I'd like to make a comment on because I have served on many nonprofit boards. Uh, the first one, uh, and I agree with Ms. Christensen on some of the things she said, but I also think there's some great things in, in the bill as well. Um, I've been on a nonprofit board where we had to find a new CEO. And I know that the competition for CEOs in the nonprofit is, is very difficult. You have to find a leader that has unique skills and commitment. And so I, I really wish they would take a look at the salary cap issue that's there. The second thing um, is uh, found on uh, subsection three, uh, beginning on line 2.14, where you kind of talk about uh, no more than 50% of the revenue uh, from state funds. And I think in your presentation, you used the word grant, but a lot of nonprofits get their funding from the state, not through grants, but through other, other means. And so I, I would like you to take a look at that. One of the things when I was on a couple of boards, we always tried to get our state funding or the money we received from the state below 70% because it was somewhat unreliable. <laughs> and so uh, I think taking a look at that uh, is another area. And then finally, uh, some of these nonprofits are fairly small and they just don't have the resources to maybe comply with some of the requirements that are in the bill. So I just, just some recommendations as you move forward with the bill. Thank, Thank you. you Madam Thank you, Sarah Chair. Clausen, Sarah Benson. And to the salary cap, I would just encourage members, when you see a nonprofit come before your committee, pull their 990 and look at what their executive directors are being paid. I think we need to really engage much more strongly with people who come to the legislature. Um, there was, a, this was again in 2013, there was an energy group that had extraordinary levels of compensation that you, Senator Claussen, would find shocking. And so I think there is a place for discussion here and some accountability. If they're gonna get a significant amount of money from the state, um, then they are looking more like a state agency and less like a charity. And so I think that's a, a good discussion for us to be having at the legislature. Your points are well taken. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Benson. And with that, um, Senate file 4359 will be laid over for possible thank inclusion. Thank you. With that, we'll go to our last bill on the agenda, Senator Rosen. Hey, Rosen, is this your first time with this committee? It is? Yes, Senator Rosen, yes, I recall, you. I think you have a rule in your committee. Oh. <laughs> but I made that very I, well known. I think since Madam you're Chair. the finance committee, I think all finance committees come under your umbrella rule. I totally agree. But we'll you. defer it for another time. You can. <laughs> well, I can pay my due later. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got to be careful. We don't know what that'll That's do. That's right. <laughs> We're talking about donuts <laughs> for everybody's. <laughs> oh, funny. Oh, well, it's a very nice to be in front of you, Madam Chair, and talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that is pensions. And um, I'm sitting here with uh, two of my favorite people, Susan Lecheski and Chad Burkett from the Pension Commission. Uh, we have before you Senate File 3540, 
which is the Omnibus Pension and Retirement Policy Bill. Um, and Madam Chair, we do have uh, three amendments. Yeah. One is the Delete Everything Amendment. Right, thank you. I'm just gonna get my, um, making sure that I have the right documentation here. And I think the first one is to move the um, DE1, the Delete Everything Amendment to Senate File 3540. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. And then I believe we have the 4A, A4 amendment. 4A amendment, this is, all right. Okay, so Thank I'll, you. I'll move the, um, we're gonna get the this bill. I know it's coming out of pension and this is, uh, uh, do we usually just go ahead and apply all the amendments and then deal, present the bill in its entirety? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, that's what I'd like to do. So when you're addressing the bill, and then afterwards you don't do an amendment and can change things in our conversation. So I'll move the um, 4A amendment to Senate File 3540 to the, the 4A is uh, moving the delete everything amendment. So this is, let's be sure that I have the correct motion, Ms. James. Okay, all right. So the 4A amendment is deleting the, is amending the delete everything amendment that we just adopted. So with that on that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion prevails. And then we have the 5A amendment also. And so I will move the 5A amendment. And all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, motion prevails. Okay. Now, Senator Rosen, to, to your bill as multi, well amended uh, bill, and just go ahead and present it as, uh, as amended here today. Thank you, Thank Senator you Rosen. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Again, it's a pleasure to be in front of your committee. Um, the legislation that's before you was approved by the Pension Commission on March 22nd of this year, and it's our uh, Pension and Retirement Policy Bill. Um, a finance bill will be coming later, but at this point, we have a policy bill that uh, was approved unanimous, uh, except for the um, those two amendments that needed to be changed. So uh, with that, I will let um, the review from Ms. Lancheski or Mr. Burkett start. Okay. And uh, Senator Rosen, and also to your testifiers, you really need to lean into the microphone. It's going to sound too loud for you, but when it does, it's just right for the room. <laughs> so uh, will you be going... First, then, um, I believe Mr. Burkett is going to start first, Madam Chair. Okay, just say your name and title, whoever's going to go first, and then present your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Chad Burkett. I'm with the Legislative Commission on Pension and Retirement. I'll be reviewing the first three articles of the bill, and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Lancheski for the rest of the bill. need to lean into that microphone I'll and speak best, loudly. <laughs> Article one addresses retirement plans administered by the Minnesota State Retirement System. Uh, the article contains uh, provisions from three sets of bills. The first is from Senate file 2614 from Senator Anderson, which expands the right of members of the MSRS retirement plans to purchase service credit for periods of military service. Under the article, a member may purchase up to five years of service credit for qualifying military service that occurred before entering state employment or for which the member did not meet the timing requirements to qualify for the right to purchase the service credit under federal law. The second set of bills are from Senate file 3556 um, by Senator Frentz and Senate file 3872, Senator Dreheim, which expand the list of positions at the Department of Human Services that are covered by the MSRS correctional plan by adding two new positions. The two new positions are residential program lead and dental hygienist. The third set of bills are Senate file 3499 from Senator Rarick and Senate file 2591 from Senator Osmick, which address issues for individuals. Section eight of the article permits the surviving spouse of a deceased state employee to purchase one month of service credit and thereby receive an annuity death benefit. And section nine fixes a reporting error for an employee of the Department of Corrections. Uh, moving on to article two, 
which addresses retirement plans administered by the Public Employees Retirement Association, or PARA. Uh, the article contains Senate File 4270 from Senator Rarick, which deals with the Duluth Transit Authority, or DTA. DTA is in the process of acquiring a private company that it had previously been con contracting with to provide transit services to Duluth and the surrounding area. The article exempts from PARA coverage certain union employees who are already covered by a national multi-employer pension plan and also provides vesting credit for non-union employees who are becoming public employees as a result of the acquisition. The article also contains Senate file 2810 from Senator Benson, which reinstates segmented annuities for para members. And segmented annuities are a method of calculating a retirement benefit that's required in some cases to prevent a non-retired member from having to accept a reduction in their pension benefit if they return to public employment after a lengthy break in service. Article three is Senate file 2913 from Senator Bigham, which permits retired teachers to return to teaching at a public school without application of an earnings limitation. The earnings limitation in law currently causes teachers to forfeit or defer pension payments if their annual earnings exceed a certain threshold. Article three suspends the earnings limitation for three years and the limit would start to apply again after 2024. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll turn things over to Ms. Lincheski now. Thank you very much, Ms. Lincheski. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Susan Lincheski, and I'm the Executive Director of the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement, uh, starting with Article 4. That is a compilation of three bells, um, SF3048, Senator Duckworth's bell, SF3540. Can you really speak into that microphone? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, SF 3540, Senator Rosen's bill, and SF 3402, Senator Bigham's bill. The bill, uh, the Article 4 deals with volunteer firefighter retirement, uh, and it is uh, divided into two, two parts. The first part, sections one through nine, deal with the statewide volunteer firefighter plan, which is a para administered plan. Pages 21 through 27 of the bill deal with uh, these changes. Uh, the changes now will allow uh, the SVF plan, as we call it, to offer volunteer firefighter relief associations three different vesting alternatives when they seek to join the plan. It should make the plan more attractive to relief associations to join. The second item um, removes a requirement that uh, if someone retires within the first five years of joining the plan, they get the prior relief association benefit rather than the generally higher benefit that would be available through the SVF plan. So this is, again, is uh, intended to make the plan a little more attractive to relief associations. Finally, um, the, the uh, sections one through nine also make clarifying changes to the procedures for joining the SVF plan. Uh, the second part of article four is sections 10 through 26. Uh, these make changes to the Volunteer Firefighter Relief Association provisions. Um, the changes here are, are very um, complicated and, and dense, but primarily the first big change is that um, sections are, our subdivisions are being repealed. So there are tables in the statutes right now, several pages of tables that will come out of the statutes and will make this a little bit easier to administer. So reliefs now will not have to determine the maximum service pension um, through a, a complicated calculation, and instead will be subject to a lesser of limit if they can't get their um, municipality to approve their increase in a benefit level. So the new level will be, um, in the case of a lump sum plan, 15,000 per year of service, or if lesser, a calculation that is done in another part of the statute to make sure that they are going to be bringing in a fire state aid to cover the increase. Uh, if the municipality is willing to um, uh, confirm or approve the increase in a benefit level, then the level is the 15,000 per year of service for lump sums. Uh, in addition, the, um, uh, the second part of the article also makes changes to allow for distributions to alternate payees under a divorce decree. This was previously not explicitly permitted, so the uh, language has been amended to allow for that. In addition, um, there is a requirement, a new requirement that is in the statute that came from Senator Duckworth's bill, and that is to require the state auditor to, to provide investment information to all reliefs that compare their rate of return to the rate of, re 
rate of return in the State Board of Investments uh, balanced fund. This is intended to provide them with information that they can use to determine whether they should be moving their assets to the uh, SBI for investment. Article five of the bill uh, is, a, is a bill um, that is uh, Senator Pappas's bill, SF 2546. It's on pages 47 to 54 of the bill. It incorporates a um, new uh, professional or new category of professional um, to those that are permitted to uh, make disability uh, determinations for purposes of the disability benefits under all of the pension plans. This new category is advanced practice registered nurses. It's a category of healthcare professional that is licensed by the Minnesota Board of Nursing. They provide an expanded scope of nursing, including assessment, diagnosing, and prescribing. And they uh, split out into four categories, uh, clinical nurse specialist, nurse midwife, nurse practitioner, or registered nurse anesthetist. So the, the statutes have been amended to include APRN throughout. So they are now permitted to also um, to be uh, one of the professionals that can make a, a, de a determination of disability for purposes Ms. of. Thank you, Ms. Lincheski. Uh, I don't know if I clarified right away from the beginning. We have a hard stop at 10 to 12. And so I, I'm just seeing the pace of which we are going through the bill. It's a lot of great information, but we're just going to run out of time I'm sorry. to do this. Yeah, sorry, Madam Chair. I will move okay. very quickly. Article six makes some technical, mostly technical changes to provisions that relate to the State Board of Investment. Article seven commissions a study to be done by the Department of Labor and Industry with regard to uh, disability benefits for police officers. And finally, Article eight is a lot of technical changes. I won't go into any of those. Thank you. Oh, wow. That was <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Rosen, is there anything in this bill or uh, that wasn't in uh, discussed in pensions? Yes. Senator uh, Rosen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator um, Howe, that was the A5 amendment that was on. Well, actually, both amendments, the A4, the 4A, which was uh, the amendment from the state auditor during the vote on this bill on the 22nd, and then realized um, that it was not necessary. So we're, we're deleting that. And she is um, here for questions and answers, too. And then that, Senator Rosen, it, do you have a page where that is the, on? Um, or staff can tell us? I, or that's uh, the amendment. 30 that's the amendment. of the okay, amendment. A5 yes. or A4. On the amendment, it's page 30, which would delete 31 through 32. The 5A amendment is the grandfather clause for the MSRS um, members that are at least 63 years of age and have 26 years of service. Um, it's something we've done in the past and give an, a one-year extension. Otherwise, they are basically penalized uh, into retiring and they get a lower annuity um, on their monthly annuity right? So that, that's the change there. Mm -hmm. And that 5A amendment has, um, and I should have talked about this before we put it on, it went fairly quickly. Um, talked with uh, Representative Nelson, who is also the co-chair, uh, Representative Driscoll, who is the uh, lead, minority lead, and Senator Pappas, who is the lead also. Representative Nelson was okay. The other two are, are, are fine with it. Okay, thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Howe? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Rosen, how many people do we have that that actually applies to? 47, uh, Madam Chair. Senator, Senator Rosen. Howe. 47. It is, um, Madam Chair, Senator a Rosen. situation where we are going to have a brain drain, a serious brain drain. Uh, with these retirements that are, are going to avoid this penalty that they have coming if they ha are forced to retire because of this. Um, and it's um, it's just to keep things running smoothly around here. <laughs> it's So Senator Rosen, uh, in reading this though, we're going back to 2016 uh, in the 
a five five a amendment. Uh, in effect, line one thirty one one thirty two. Um, actuarial uh, assumptions in effect on um, June thirtieth two thousand. Madam Chair, it just goes back for it just extends it for one year. Okay. Yes, but right. Miss Lincheski, if could um, could answer that, probably better. Okay, are there any other questions, members? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. It looks like this is gonna be moved to general orders. Uh, Senator Rosen and I have been working on section seven and um, we've been discussing whether or not to expand the pension study to firefighters and state troopers. Wondering if I could work with Senator Rosen as you know, with an amendment prior to, uh, to passage on the floor, if she'd like to address it here. Madam Chair. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Pratt, absolutely. We've had uh, many discussions on that. That'd be great, thank you. And um, there is a fiscal part to that section of the bill that is being carried on being tracked. Okay, thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Pratt. Um, Senator Pratt, do you have a page number for that? Section seven, this has got articles, so there's some- Oh, I'm there. sorry, um, it was article seven, I meant it's page 59. Article seven, okay. That makes more sense. Okay. Madam Chair, could Senator could, Rosen, could we have uh, Ms. Lincheski speak to the FIA amendment? I see there's still some uh, yes. perhaps confusion in I my I think that'd be good, and we have a few minutes, so let's do that. Ms. Lincheski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so back in 2016, uh, MSRS uh, looked at their actuarial assumptions. Those assumptions needed to be changed. They came to the commission. Those were approved. These actuarial assumptions resulted in a change in so-called factors that are used to convert an account in the unclassified plan into an annuity. When the assumptions were changed, the factors were changed, and that meant that people got a smaller monthly annuity than they would have gotten under the old factors. So the grandfather was put in to allow back in 2016 to allow these um, individuals who retire within this window and they have to be at least age 63 or uh, have at least 26 years of service to take advantage of these um, better factors. And the impact was about a 7% decrease in the monthly amount. So $1,000 a month would be about $930 a month if you didn't retire by the date of this change taking effect. So since nine, uh, 2016, we've, amend, uh, we've uh, amended the statute to um, extend the grandfather and now we're doing it for one more year. Okay, Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what happens next year? And what happens the following year? I mean, we, we keep moving the goalpost one year at a time. Uh, do we see an, an eventual end of the date or are we just, as long as we keep paying them more, they'll stay here or what? what do, I, I guess I'm, I'm looking for an end result. Uh, otherwise, why don't we just extend it for five years or you know, nobody wants, I guess everybody's resistant to do that, but I'm just wondering, are we just waiting for them all to, to retire so we can end this or what are we gonna do? Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Howe. Um, this is, as I said, um, I, I conferred with the, the leads on, on each of the bodies. Um, they were comfortable with a one-year extension. Yes, we, we did this again last year. Very concerned, we're all concerned about the brain drain. Um, because it's just for representative Senate legislative courting commission, which includes the revisor's office. And stability, I think, was the main concern in our minds when we discussed this. Um, the Senate will not have the gavel next year. It'll be the House that has a pension gavel, and I won't be here. So <laughs> this is out of my hands, but I think this is a reasonable alternative to creating some stability uh, with all the retirements and, and people not running for office and uh, our front desk at the Senate chamber. And like I said, the revisor's office, there's a lot of, of influx and, and instability and um, I just keeping things, not forcing a, re, a, a retirement when they're not ready to, I think is, is very, very important. Okay, Senator Howell. We'll talk later, I guess. I, I'll move to make a, 
uh, to I'll move Senate file 3540 to be passed and recommended to general orders. As amended. As amended. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. You're on your way to general orders, but it sounds like Senator Rosen, there might be a little work on the way. There is work on the way. Thank yeah. you, Madam Chair, very much for the hearing. And thank you, Senator Howell for the, and thank you members. All right. With that members having completed the work of this committee for today, um, we will be releasing our um, <laughs> budget bill um, later this week and there'll be a hearing next week, Tuesday. So that's a little bit of what's coming here. All right. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>